here's my cost for my development project and here's my outcome. What's my outcome going to be? Maybe it's ROI. Maybe it's something that gets me that next promotion. Maybe it's revenue growth. And then suddenly we shifted to rather than talking in these big change the world type phrasing that worked for the motivated entrepreneur, suddenly we were getting very granular with our messaging. Technology is just the tool by which we deliver the business value to an organization. And that's what we've got to focus on first, right? You focus on the outcome rather than the how or the what of how you're going to do it. And we literally said at the end of our sort of two week uh, pre-sales engagement, your team's not ready and it's probably not the right idea to go into that now. And they were very appreciative of that. We said, look, we only want to take your money if you're going to be successful. Because if you're successful, then we're successful. And that's really what it should be rather than here's a product, we've built it, but you know, no one uses it now. I mean, that's useless to everyone. And that's next on Bootstrapping Your Dreams show. So, the big question is this. How are ambitious people like us, who don't have a lot of resources, did not go to Ivy League colleges, were not born into wealth, how do we become resourceful enough, use our creativity, our dedication, and a little bit of crazy, to bootstrap our way to realizing our dreams? Whether it is launching a new company, launching a new app, or making it to the top of the corporate ladder, that is the question, and this podcast will give you the answers. Hey listeners and viewers, we have created a tremendous community of bootstrappers, entrepreneurs, and professionals who are ambitious, resourceful, and want to get things done. We brainstorm, support, and help each other out. Come join us, navigate to bootstrapping. If you like this video, do not forget to hit that like button now. Or if you want us to improve our content, go ahead and hit the thumbs down button and give us your feedback in the comment section below. Here at Tetra Noodle, we are passionate about entrepreneurship, technology and innovation. Every week, we bring you insightful and engaging interviews, tips, tricks and strategies to help you grow your business or rise in your corporate profession. So if you're new here, please consider subscribing and do not forget to hit that bell icon so that you are notified when we pop. Hello and welcome to this new episode of Bootstrapping Your Dreams show. I'm your host Manuj Agarwal and today we'll be talking with Patrick Ward. So Patrick is a director of marketing at Rootstrap and the creator of Words with Ward. A writer by trade, Patrick has worked extensively across insurance, real estate, finance, travel, and tech industries with notable clients, including Alliance, Cathay Pacific, and Fiji Airways. Currently, he lives in LA, uh, being born in and raised in Sydney, Australia. He's a diehard Steelers fan. Um, Patrick is an accomplished public speaker that teaches LinkedIn workshops at General Assembly and guest lectures at USC on AI and technology disruption. Welcome, Patrick. Thanks for having me, Manoj. Yeah, all right, great. So. Uh, before we get uh, started with all the questions, uh, can you help us, um, uh, can you take us down the memory lane and tell us how did you get started? How did you uh, come over from Australia to US and uh, got involved in technology? Yeah, totally. So uh, my ma- background's as a marketer. And so when I was in university, I was deciding, okay, what's my major going to be? What's going to be the career path that I'm going to choose? So I started with economics. That wasn't right for me. I then went into finance. That wasn't right with me. And then I found marketing. And the reason that I really loved marketing is that it fit two main parts. One, it was about communication, which I have always been fascinated by the way that we communicate with one another, the psychology behind how we think about both ourselves and, and the world around us. Mm-hmm. And then also it fitted my, my extroverted tendencies in that the field of marketing is able to cross a whole bunch of different areas. Um, as you mentioned, I'm now in technology, but have also been in real estate, insurance, finance, food and beverage, travel, a whole bunch of different industries. So, so marketing was a real good fit there. 
And so I was in an ad agency uh, back in Australia. I'd been there for about three years as a copywriter. Mm -hmm. And I was looking for that, that next propulsion in my career. How do, where do I go from here? Because, you know, I was, I was yet pretty young at the time, you know, 21, 22, coming out of college. And I thought, there's got to be something more. So I'd studied abroad before in America and I thought, you know, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go, I'm going to leave my current job, which everyone said was just crazy. And I'm going to go to America, have a crack, see what happens. And if it works, great. And if it doesn't, well, I'll just have to drag myself back to Australia. Yeah. So I, I, I did that four years ago and, and the first couple of years was, was very challenging uh, to say the least, but, um, so uh, after a while, found my feet, found a new community of people and um, really got myself very, very well set. And, and that's where you find me today. Nice, nice. That's great. Yeah. I mean, as you said, marketing is, um, is, a, is a unique combination of communications, understanding uh, human psychology and not just, um, you know, individual psychology, but uh, mass psychology, right? Absolutely. I think the, the key to understanding where... Uh, marketing goes is that it's about effective communication and so many marketers think that if I just put out enough messages or if I put out a message in multiple different platforms they get so tied to the tactics they use rather than thinking well let's take the step back what is the thought process behind this why would anyone be interested because at the end of the day I can give you a lot of messages, but unless you understand it in the way that I want you to understand it, my communication is ineffective. And I think that's a, a crucial point that a lot of marketers forget is that it's not so much what you're saying, but how others understand what you're saying. Cool. Um, and uh, what, uh, tell me uh, about uh, Words with Ward series. So what is that about? So Words with Ward was my way of coming on to LinkedIn. So I have been a writer for many, many years now. And I've always been fascinated with, you know, the different words that we use, right? Like little things. And uh, I mean, one of the first examples I noticed in the business workplace is when you write an email, sometimes people will say, just wanted to get your feedback. And I thought about that word, just, that seems a very what's known as a passive qualifier and it makes you sound less sure of yourself and that's something I, I really don't like to see because I know that many people are experts in their field and they should use words strong and confidently in order to share their message mm -hmm. so I thought well if I'm so interested in how people are using you know words maybe other people are and so I, I took it to LinkedIn and I, I asked people two very simple questions I ask them, what's one word you would like people to use more of? And two, what is one word you would like people to use less of? And the words that people choose, it's fascinating because not only does it show you what they value, it also shows you how they think about the world. And uh, just the series has, has grown and grown and grown. Got a lot of people, yourself included, who participated. We're very appreciative of that. And it's just been interesting as a, as a community to start to look into just these little things. It's always the everyday work, like just, that, you know, it seems very simple and yet there's a whole lot that, that comes from that. Yeah, yeah, words have a lot of power. A um, uh, few words can uh, start or stop wars. Absolutely, I think the key is being very careful and intentional with your words because when you, have a certain use of words or a certain use of jargon, it shows how you will be understood. It also shows how you'll think about yourself. So a, a classic example I like to use is, if I ask you how your day's going, you could tell me good, great, or not bad. Not bad is a really bad one because a lot of people use it and it's a double negative. It actually makes you start to feel a little more negative when you say it. So change that to a positive and suddenly your mood can be uh, uplifted. And that's a very, it's a very simple thing. It's the same mechanism by which we have our face. If you smile, you will feel more happy. It's called a facial feedback hypothesis that by using uh, mechanisms to trick, trick your brain, 
into feeling a certain way, you create your own reality in a certain way. And it's no different with words. Cool. All right. And how do you translate that in, um, say, uh, your marketing messaging or helping businesses grow? Um, and, uh, you know, how do you apply that in, in, the, in your art that, uh, and your profession? Yeah, so I think the, the key here is, uh, I'll, I'll tell a little story of how I came on to, to Rootstrap. So that's my current company. And the way that I came to them is uh, a friend of mine who works for them, he brought me in and we started to discuss about their messaging. And very quickly it became obvious that all of their messaging was targeted as how do you build an app? What do you need to think about when you start building an app? And these types of phrases were very... Uh, synonymous with the motivated entrepreneur category. These are people in startups. Now, that's great if you want to target startups. But the funny thing was, is that the company wanted to target more enterprise level. And so suddenly they could see, well, the language we're using is not attracting the type of people we want. So I came in and said, well, let's think about it from an enterprise perspective. They're not running with a vision necessarily in the same way a motivated entrepreneur is doing it. It's probably going to be someone, you know, middle of the hierarchy, maybe he's got a couple of layers above him. And so he needs to be thinking very tangibly in terms of here's my cost for my development project and here's my outcome. What's my outcome going to be? Maybe it's ROI. Maybe it's something that gets me that next promotion. Maybe it's revenue growth. And then suddenly we shifted to rather than talking in these big change the world type phrasing that worked for the motivated entrepreneur, suddenly we were getting very granular with our messaging. Suddenly we were focusing on, you know, masterclass. We took them to a hundred million in revenue or ownable. We helped them do two and a half million on one day on a black Friday for their sales. Right. Suddenly the types of stories even though they were the same client and we talked about them before, we're talking about them in a different way because the audience has shifted. And that's, I think, a very important component is that understanding you can take the very same story but talk about it in a different way depending on who that end audience is. Yeah, yeah, awesome. And um, let's, uh, let's try to take uh, one example and uh, dissect it a little bit. Um, uh, you know, uh, you mentioned a few names uh, do you you want to pick a favorite one that was sort of more challenging and we 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 talked through it a little bit? Yeah, I think um, Masterclass is probably the best example. So Masterclass is a very interesting case. When we first partnered with them, we literally had a, a single developer. Mm -hmm. And by having a single developer, he, he started on a very micro part of the project and it just grew and grew and grew and grew. Now, the, the key challenges uh, in the first instance was at the time we were quite a young company when we started with Masterclass and we really had to make our internal processes very robust uh, because we were taking our developers and embedding them in the Masterclass's existing team. That was essentially why they hired us in the first place. They, they had a few developers but not enough for what they were were trying to achieve in terms of revenue uh, when they first came to us it was literally we want to double our revenue uh, in a year and that that was no small feat you know when you're already at 50 million and you got to get to 100 million that's that's a pretty tall order mm -hmm. and so understanding the way that our development teams could work cohesively with them be able to give them enough autonomy that they were able to talk directly with Masterclass um, was a very important aspect for us because obviously, like any company, we want to make sure that we're providing the support and the necessary training to our developers. But at the same time, we didn't want to be providing red tape, right? We didn't want to be putting an artificial barrier between their conversation directly with Masterclass representatives. Um, but then slowly, as, as the relationship evolved, it, it became uh, very prosperous in that way to the point, and, and this is, I think, one of the, the key parts of, of why this particular client was so successful for us, that when Masterclass was looking to hire 
additional developers uh, here in, in the United States, they actually asked our team to assist them with interviewing, making sure that their developers that they were bringing on board were matching our standards. And that was really creating a nice level of synergy between our two organizations. And ultimately it led to uh, the success that we saw. Because at the end of the day, uh, Masterclass, like, like many uh, organizations within the, the e-learning space, uh, rely on certain promotional times to get more memberships. And, and in our particular case, it was Black Friday. So we ran a promotion with them called uh, Buy One, Give One, where you could buy a membership and you could grant a membership to, to a friend of yours. Now, naturally, we knew that there was going to be a substantial increase in, in traffic, and therefore we needed to make sure that the systems that we put in place were, were scalable to that level and wouldn't break, because obviously if they did, that could be costing Masterclass um, many millions of dollars. But of course, you know, through those embedded teams, through those teams that managed to communicate very effectively with one another because that foundation had been set, Therefore, the technology was was very stable, and we were able to help them achieve that goal. Awesome, that's great. And so, how did you uh, how did you scale it? Um, were you using like uh, some sort of a cloud provider? Uh, because obviously, once the once the promotion was over, you need to scale it back as well, right? Yeah. So uh, a big part of our partnering uh, tends to be with AWS, which makes it um, very. Uh, scalable, as you say, for when we need to do it for big promotions, but also bring it back. Um, and then even beyond the, the mere infrastructure of the data, it's also scaling our team. So the way that we invest in bringing on new team members with new sets of technologies and developing their top technologies consistently. Uh, I myself have been in the, the app and web development space for a number of years, and I've never seen the way that Rootstrap actually allocates, physically allocates 15% uh, of a developer's time exclusively to uh, learning new technologies. And not only just allocating that time, but making sure nothing infringes on that time. Because as we all know, uh, within uh, any sort of agency setup, anytime there's billable work, that can lead to encroachment on internal, tasks, internal projects, upskilling, any of these other areas. And what often ends up happening is those tasks get pushed down the line. Whereas we have made the internal commitment to our developers saying, look, we are going to give you this space. We are going to give you this time. We are not going to infringe on it because we understand that technology is rapidly changing so much with so many different languages, even languages that were relevant you know, three years ago uh, are no longer relevant. And so it's important, not only for the health of our organization, but also the, the quality of our developers so that they are able to, to pursue the learning that they need to remain at, at the top of their game. And it's a competitive industry. Yeah, yeah for sure. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, most of the progressive companies, they do need to invest in their employees because human capital is the most important capital. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, it's commendable that you ensure that it doesn't um, get sacrificed because of billable hours or any other priority. Um, and not only, not only that, but one other thing I've been impressed by, and, and this is, is a testament to the statistic, we have a 96% retention rate is that we give professional development as well as technical development. So uh, there are a lot of, uh, most of our developers are based in Uruguay, Montevideo. We also have a shop in um, Argentina and, and Buenos Aires, uh, but predominantly Uruguay. And there are a lot of other companies, uh, Cognizant, uh, Tata Consultancy, that are also in Uruguay. But the key thing is they don't give their employees FaceTime with clients. We oh. do. And that is crucial, right? We, we respect our team enough to say, look, you are doing the work. You are going to liaise with the client. You are going to communicate with the client. We're going to give you the tools and the training to help you do that. But ultimately, that will be more beneficial to you as a developer because we don't want code monkeys. We want strategic, you know, senior developers who can 
continue to both deliver good work, but then also be able to, you know, tell the client, hey, maybe that's not the best way to do it. Maybe we should think about it a different way. Because at the end of the day, technology is just the tool by which we deliver the business value to an organization. And that's what we've got to focus on first, right? You focus on the outcome rather than the how or the what of how you're going to do it. For sure, yeah. And uh, one question, uh, one point that you brought up was uh, about languages. So just to clarify, we are talking about programming languages, right? Yes. So uh, how important is it, in your opinion, um, to use a particular language uh, for a particular project? Um, because, you know, as you said, like languages come and go. Uh, so how important it is to stay on top of it? Uh, we've found it to be very important purely from an efficiency perspective. Um, so we actually had a client come in to us the other day uh, who wanted to code the, the entire thing in Angular 1, which was just, you know, we managed to pull a few resources together who had that coding experience, but quite frankly, it's woefully out of date and wasn't going to work. So really what we had to start with was, okay, you've got this code base, you, you've got it built in Angular 1, but it's going to take four times longer to code in this than if we switched it to a completely different set of technologies or languages. And that was a tough conversation to have with a client because obviously there is a, there's a level of inertia, right? The client is thinking in terms of, well, I've already got this existing technology, I've already got this existing code, can't I just build on top of it? But ultimately, the client was very appreciative of us taking that perspective to them because at the end of the day, it saved them more money. And that's really, again, something that I've seen in Rootstrap that has been very different. A lot of development agencies will go out there, they'll build a product for you uh, just purely by what you ask for, rather than taking that step back and going, hang on, we could save you a lot of money here or maybe you're not even ready to do development. I'd never heard of a development agency turning down projects. I, there was a, a case uh, recently with uh, Chelsea Handler's team, and we were going to go into uh, a development for an app for them. And we literally said at the end of our sort of two week uh, pre-sales engagement, your team's not ready and it's probably not the right idea to go into that now. And they were very appreciative of that. We said, look, we only want to take your money if you're going to be successful. Because if you're successful, then we're successful. And that's really what it should be, rather than here's a product, we've built it, but you know, no one uses it now. I mean, that's useless to everyone. Yeah, for sure, for sure. And um, let's talk about emerging technology. So you, um, you lecture on AI and, uh, and uh, similar sort of uh, up and coming technologies. So how much of that are you seeing being incorporated into the new projects that you're working on? Yeah, so we're certainly doing quite a bit of work with uh, AI, specifically machine learning. And I think there is a key difference, obviously, between yeah. AI and machine learning. Um, a lot of people, when they think of AI, think of you know, Skynet, Terminator, like actual intelligent computers. And we're certainly not there. Much better to think about machine learning, which obviously diagnoses a, a whole lot of patterns very quickly that a human, you know, would take thousands of hours to do and then proceeds to give recommendations there. Uh, we're also doing quite a bit with IoT, um, particularly within the healthcare space. So uh, looking into with some clients of remote patient monitoring, um, sensors, that sort of thing. I think the, the key that we've found with uh, most emerging technologies is one, it's important to be on top of them as obviously they will be disruptive, but it's also important not to get too carried away with them. Um, so a lot of my lectures is uh, particularly about AI is about cautioning you know, students saying like, look, it is it's a factor, it is important to be aware of it, but you know, it's not taking all the jobs. You know, robots are not going to murder all humans over the next five, 10, 20 years. It's about keeping a, a, an honest 
perspective when it comes to these emerging technologies and understanding the, the power of what they, they can do and they can't do. Mm -hmm. So particularly uh, at, at USC, I, I uh, lecture about AI with respect to journalism. So all I uh, really focus on at the end of that is AI is not going to get rid of journalists. It's going to help you do your job better. Suddenly, you're not having to clamber through, you know, thousands and thousands of articles for the right statistic or the, the thing to tell your particular story. You know, suddenly you can do that in a matter of minutes. But at the end of the day, focus on the elements that are uniquely human, you know, the creativity, the way we build rapport with other people, the way we build relationships with each other, that is uniquely human and that is not going to be replaced by AI. Yeah, that's for sure. Yeah, I mean, uh, the landscape of jobs may change and they are changing already, but uh, I also think that um, it's just, we'll need to adapt to AI and, uh, and, and, and maybe, you know, do our jobs differently or maybe the, the type of jobs that we do will be slightly different. As you said, like it may be more collecting the raw information and feeding it to the AI systems and, and uh, getting the output. Well, a hundred percent. I mean, we've been down this path before, like when the internet was first in its infancy, everyone was like, oh no, it's the end of jobs as we know it, mm -hmm. you know, or even I go one step further back. Well, Let's take the car. When the car came in, it built a whole bunch of industries. It built mechanics, it built auto insurance. But what did it replace? Well, you know, horseshoers and, and those sorts of jobs, you know, horse and buggy was suddenly out. Yeah. Every time a technology comes in, it doesn't destroy jobs and that's the end of it. It also creates many, many more new ones. Exactly, exactly. Um, all right, let's talk about LinkedIn now. So uh, you said that uh, you've been quite active on LinkedIn. So tell us a little bit about that journey. Um, how do you leverage LinkedIn and uh, what kind of results have you gotten so far? Yeah, so when I started with LinkedIn, uh, it was a couple of years ago. Like many of us, I'd, I'd had a profile and uh, just sort of left it at that, left it as a, as a resume, you know, online. Uh, and then I went to uh, what was called the Masters of LinkedIn Summit. It was with a bunch of uh, big time content creators who, you know, I didn't know who any of them were at the time, but now knowing them, I, I realize how, how prolific they are on the platform. These were people like Goldie Chan, Just Q, Michaela Alexis, a bunch of different people. And they really encouraged saying like, the time is now, LinkedIn, is where Facebook was sort of circa 2010, 2011. A lot of organic reach, um, but it's a professional platform. And that's something that I obviously wanted to, to explore. I'd been in social media my entire career and, and quite honestly was unimpressed with a lot of the other social platforms, but I found the right mix on LinkedIn where it was professional, it was elevated content, but you could share a message and, and resonate quite deeply and so through that i experimented with a bunch of different content obviously words with ward being my main consistent thing that i i use time and time again and i i stumbled across this very simple yet unique strategy where rather than trying to sell in the content i saw too many people still doing the old approach of you know they'll give a few lines and then they'll just say call me this was it sounded too much like a used car salesman and it just doesn't work. So instead I was thinking, well, what I need to do is I need to drive people to my profile. The content is the signal. It will capture their attention. And then if they're intrigued enough, they'll go to my profile. From my profile, they now have a short uh, blurb uh, about my company, uh, the particular role, and I've changed it as I've changed jobs. That feeds to a very simple call to action. Uh, email me or call me or send me a message. And that obviously works within the app and web development space because I'm not going to sell you with a Facebook ad. Like our minimum budget is about a hundred thousand dollars. So you, you're going to have to talk to someone in order to be convinced that this is the right avenue to go down. Mm -hmm. And then from there, 
I'm just collecting the direct messages, interacting them like we are now over a Zoom call or preferably in person. And then through that, uh, cl hopefully closing them to clients. Uh, and then with my first uh, web and app development agency that I work for, I generated uh, $650,000 worth of business from LinkedIn alone. And, and that was all because I just showed up, shared content and enough people, you know, went into my direct messages and then we started a conversation and built some relationships. That was fantastic. I mean, that already was enough justification to be on LinkedIn. But then I suddenly found all these other opportunities. Suddenly I was being invited onto podcasts like we are now. Suddenly I was invited um, by the memberships of Forbes and AdAge and have been contributing to them for a number of months now. So I've got my name in publications. Then I also started LinkedIn Local LA, which is uh, within the brand of LinkedIn Locals. There are a group of networking events all around the world, 650 cities. So I started LA's one. Again, LinkedIn was the platform to do that. And it's just funny where I now look at the, the stability of my career, but also the acceleration of it to achieving more and more success. And so much of it I can tie directly to that initial decision to get active on LinkedIn. That's awesome. That's great. Congratulations. Now, how, how can um, somebody get started? Like if, if uh, somebody wants to get started on LinkedIn, what is the uh, one or two pieces of advice you will give them? I think the first piece of advice is creating a content theme. So that's what I did with Words with Ward. Because what you want to do is you want to get known for a particular type of content. And it doesn't really matter what it, what, what it is. So in my case, Words with Ward is what I'm known as, even though it has nothing to do with technology. It is merely the signal that drives people to your profile. So when coming up with your content theme, I always tell people, what is something, if I asked you to come up with 20, 40 ideas for posts right now, what could you rattle off that quickly? Because so many people get started on LinkedIn or any other social media platform do it for two weeks and then they run out of ideas. And that is the worst thing. It will cripple your chance of success. You need to be consistent. So it's got to be something that you are just so passionate about that it, it, it comes just so naturally to you. Yeah. And then the, the, the second component uh, to being successful, particularly if you're just starting out, is identifying people within either your industry, potential clients, potential prospects, commenting on their stuff first and then connecting with them because when you share your content you don't want to just put it out there and expect people to engage you need to have created an audience first so that they will engage with that content then that will magnify to some of their audience which will probably also be relevant to who you're trying to target and then that's the viral effect suddenly from little to bigger to bigger and you know even more and i think that's that's a, a important point too many people just start from posting thinking like well if i just posted it and someone's going to see it not necessarily you've got to have a good distribution strategy in place uh not just a content creation strategy awesome that's great well um thank you so much for being with us today and uh, sharing the uh, you know, uh, a lot of wisdom about uh, diverse topics. We talked about marketing, we talked about uh, technology, we talked about AI and LinkedIn. Uh, so uh, it has been an interesting and um, educational, entertaining uh, conversation. Thank you so much. Now, before I let you go, obviously people can find you on LinkedIn, but how else can we find you? Uh, yeah, obviously find me on LinkedIn, linkedin.com slash IN slash Patrick James Ward, or one word, um, or the other place you can check out uh, my company, Rootstrap, so rootstrap.com. Uh, and then the other thing, if you're in the LA area, check out linkedinlocalla.eventbrite.com. Uh, that's our landing page for all our upcoming uh, LinkedIn local events. Awesome. That's great. Well, thank you so much. I'll uh, uh, make sure those links are in the show notes so that people can reach out to you easily. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you so much. All right, that was awesome. Thank you. And that's all for now. Until next time. Now, 
If you are an entrepreneur or a career professional, then I invite you to join our growing community. Navigate to bootstrapping.group. As a welcome bonus, you will get the Startup Founders Technology Accelerator video series and Mastering Your Inner Game video series absolutely free. This series of short videos address some core issues which are instrumental in helping you move forward in your business or career. The videos are yours to view and share for free. No obligations or strings attached, except for one. You have to take action and implement it. So join us today, navigate to bootstrapping.group. If you want more engaging videos and insightful interviews with industry's thought leaders, then check out the other videos we have picked for you. The link is right there. And if you want to be notified about our new content, please do consider subscribing to our channel.